Here's the million dollar question. How do men like us reach our full potential and grow into the men we dream of being while taking care of our responsibilities, working, being good husbands, fathers, and still take care of ourselves? That's the question. This podcast will help you with those answers. My name is Brent and welcome to the Fallible Man Podcast. Welcome to the Fallible Man Podcast, your home for all things man, husband, and father. We provide content to help men become the men they want to be. And on today's show, we're talking to author and former exotic dancer, Corey Hilton, about his book, Take It Off, Revelations of a Male Exotic Dancer, and the lessons he has learned along the way. Corey, welcome to the show. Oh, Brent, thanks so much for having me on, man. This is actually really, really cool. Listen to a few of your episodes. I'm absolutely pumped to be on this show. So once again, thank you. I'm honored. Oh, oh. man, no, thank you for coming on. So if you listen to a couple episodes, you know that I don't really introduce my guests because that's just not accurate. I get to read all your press kits and stuff, and I've read the book. So I'm going to yeah. ask you the first and most important question probably is, who is Corey Hilton now? Oh, man. Well, that's a good question. Um, because really, I'm a lot different person than I am the the, the, the person that was in the book, uh, in a way. Now, as you know, if you read it, there's a component of it that is a storyline. And then there's a component of it at the end of every chapter that's called the naked truth. The naked truth is coming out of my mouth from my 50 year old mindset that is responsible, accountable, that really took accountability for my actions in a lot of those stories and revealed that naked truth because that was something that was where, where I truly grew, not only as an author, but as a person through my writing process. So that took some work and it took some of the hardest work that I've ever done in my life, not necessarily physically, but it came down to really being able to accept the version of myself who I am now, more so than I ever accepted myself even when I was on stage before, because I focused so much on the exterior and never really worked on my interior. So I was never really understanding what authenticity meant. I didn't really recognize my core values. I didn't actually recognize the feelings that those core values represented. So in a lot of ways, Brent, I was just going through the slot machine of life and letting the chips fall where they may. And now that I have a far more structure, I feel that I'm a far better version of myself. And it is my responsibility now to be able to get that message out to a lot of the men out there in particular that struggle with a lot of the same things that I went through self doubt, lack, unworthiness, all those things that a lot of people do, especially emotional disconnection. That's just me talking to my 30 year old self in a lot of ways. So you know, if I can help somebody not fall through the cracks that I fell through, hey, it's a really good purpose to be doing for the rest of my life in a lot of ways. And it's a, an aspect of creativity that I, I truly appreciate having more so than even the creativity that I had on stage. So yeah, it's awesome. So I've got to ask, and guys, if you haven't read the book yet, the book will be linked <laughs> on my website. You can get it. This is this is what it looks like. But mm -hmm. I've got to ask, and if you don't understand this, well, you just kind of have to read the book. Is Dalton <laughs> Strong fully retired? Yeah, Dalton actually had the G string got burnt about uh, a little over well, almost 10 years ago now. I had to burn it because if I didn't burn it, I'd probably throw it back on and when I shouldn't have. So I, uh, yeah, no, I, I retired <laughs> that name and everything uh, a long time ago. Not that I really wanted to, uh, to be straightforward about it, Brent. I just kind of realized that I was at that point where I just didn't want to be the guy that, that I kind of originally saw when I first started dancing years and years before. And I saw a guy that was out there on stage and he really kind of shouldn't have been out there and I just didn't want to be that guy I almost I kind of wanted to leave on top or at least leave at a position where I could kind of leave with my head held high so I did but at the same time there's still a hunger there it never really goes away even now right like you get these ideas in your head or whatever it is and you kind of you have that hunger for that adrenaline rush to be back on stage because I really didn't even necessarily do it for the money and I didn't necessarily do it for the women I actually really did it because I love getting an emotional reaction out of people whether it was laughing whether it was crying whether it was just screaming take it off whatever it was <laughs> i absolutely loved that reaction it was like man i just fed off of it so yeah that's the that's where you know I, I have an element of creativity it's just not the same you know you don't get the live response right so it's just a different thing and i'm hoping to get into the public speaking arena here fairly shortly and maybe do a ted talk or whatever and you know be able to kind of hit the the self-help realm through a bit of a different lens let's just put it that way because i think <laughs> a lot of the stuff that's out there kind of gets regurgitated if you know what i mean but i just want to kind of throw a different angle in there so that it kind of gives my clients an ability to have a little fun with the process maybe read a chapter of the book relate to what 
what I've gone through. I want to open that door for them so that they can kind of go, hey, you know what? This guy kind of walked that walk. And if he's vulnerable, vulnerable enough and open enough to be able to re- reveal that and show, you know, what he's gone through, maybe I'm vulnerable enough to do that as well. And it takes courage to be, you know, really authentic and, and address those things. And sometimes we block a lot of that stuff. So I sure as heck did. And I didn't even know I was blocking it. So yeah, it's well, something that, you know, respect, for, respect for understanding that, that there is a point. There are so many professionals in various industries that they hit that apex mm-hmm. and then they're so addicted to that feeling and that response and that adrenaline and that the moment yeah. that they, they just keep pushing a little farther and pushing a little farther. Right. We get some amazing quarterbacks who had incredible careers and then get injured uh, because they tried to push too far and just got old enough that it became more dangerous for them. Or the guys just got younger and they just got hit wrong uh, and their yep. bodies don't quite bounce back as well. We've got, I've seen a, in probably every major athletic uh, event or sport that I, I don't follow many sports. I follow a lot of other things, but right. you know, I've seen it in Strongman and uh, yeah. several other places where it's just like, you held on just a little too long, man. It, it takes a lot of discipline to go, hey, you know what? I'm in a I'm good out. place. And now, now is the time to make my graceful exit <laughs> and maybe you look for a new adventure. Um, yeah. man, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of understanding yourself and a lot of discipline to just go, it's time for the next chapter. Yeah. Well, you know, my, my first, the, the, the career lasted for 25 rig, frigging crazy, years, crazy right? from 17 till almost 43. So, you know, by the time I hit that age, I was kind of like, yeah, maybe it is time to kind of move into something different. And the funny thing about that though, really is that I always looked at it after I got out of the industry, I was kind of lost. I was kind of trying to find my way and I went into corporate and I got my, even I went in and I got my mutual fund license and life license to be a financial advisor. And I, I dove into all these dry books and all that stuff. And I was, you know, I was, I was sitting in a cubicle and all that, you know, the regular nine to five grind. And it just kind of felt like I, I died inside. I wasn't really, I didn't really have a, the feeling of really true purpose that I wanted to get out of bed every day to do what I was doing. Right. So it was, I kind of, in a way, kind of sold my dream for the paycheck. And now I'm just giving it everything I got to be able to hold on to my dream and do something that I can feel good about getting out of bed every day. And I know that I can impact other people with my message now, but at the t- a while back, though i didn't think that i actually had any value i just kind of looked at it as like oh yeah what's anybody going to listen to some guy that took off his clothes for 25 years like who why who would listen to that right and i i got that that saboteur inside my own brain just said no no and, and then i had people coming up to me and saying oh you should write a book you should write a book and i should have done myself for a long time and then i finally did and then it was just kind of like it wasn't enough i needed to put the personal development aspect into that and that's where that brought me into the coaching realm now where i actually help out other authors to be able to write authentically too so it's kind of a cool process that it's just i didn't really expect it to the road to go where it went but i'm really glad that it did and i'm really excited to see where the road's going to bring me in the next little while so yeah it's cool all the way you around. know I, I think a lot of men not all out of us have uh, spent much time taking our clothes off most of us are you know <laughs> scrambling to put our clothes on before the lights come <laughs> on uh but no i you know what you said rings really true is how many men have traded dreams for a paycheck, right? Mm-hmm. To build security or whatever. I mean, that's that's how I ended up podcasting, right? I, I work mm-hmm. at a full-time job, mm-hmm. but I'm sitting in a cubicle slowly dying. And so I, I got into obstacle course events and started doing that because I needed to do something physical to counteract the fact that I was sitting at a desk all the time. But I it. think a lot of us know, right? We, we have these dreams, but we know we need the financial security. We know we need. And so we trade it in because it's like, oh, you can't have both. You can't yeah, you got, you have, have no stability. Choice. You can't and chase your dreams. And so I, I think a lot of men can relate to that story, whether it's yeah. this industry that you are in or a different industry. We all yeah. have that same story, I think. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that, you know, for myself anyways, like, you know, a lot of people, they get the stereotypical thought of, oh, this guy was a male dancer. Well, when you, what do you, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think about a guy that was a male dancer? Yeah, massive ego. Uh, he was a total slut. Uh, all he cared about was money and women and all that stuff, right? It's just an automatic default. That's what everybody thinks, right? Even myself, right? Like, <laughs> you know, really honest about it. But at the same time, like I tried my best in my own way from a good, for a good portion of my career, not to be 
be the egotistical guy. When I was out on stage, I like to have a lot of fun. I like to make women laugh. I really just kind of like didn't really, I didn't want to be Mr. Macho Man up there. But the funny thing is, is, is that a lot of the struggles that I went through, whether it was through divorce or addictions or whatever it was, hey, these are all relatable things that anybody out there can actually really understand and be able to resonate with. It's just seen through a bit of a different lens is all. And, you know, like I said, if the guy that was up there taking his clothes off for a living, getting screamed and yelled at and all the rest of it as this quote superstar, if he was dealing with the, the lack of confidence and the lack of self-worth, you know, maybe that's something that maybe somebody that, that is dealing with it on another level can go, well, well, if that guy was dealing with it, maybe I can actually get out of this as well because, you know, he struggled, even him. You know, and there's a lot of superstars out there that have been on the maybe in a rock stars or even actors or whatever that have had an inside inner struggle that nobody knows about. They put the smile on their face. They put it on for the show and all that. But when the lights come down and you're back at your hotel room or whatever, you're alone, you're searching for the friends and you don't have them because there's other people out there that are obviously that they're, they're trying to be your acquaintance for all the wrong reasons or whatever it is. And you just don't you feel hollow inside. And I've really, truly been there, man. I really have. And I'm really glad, you know, even though it's not the same lifestyle that I had before, I really, really don't take for granted my flat tire five. I've got five close, close friends that I know that regardless of whether I was stripped naked, literally financially or whatever it might be, they would still be there because they don't care about all the rest of that BS. They just care about me as a person, right? And vice Mm -hmm. versa. And that feels good at this time in my life. And you just can't take that for granted now, you know, so just a different thing now. So, Corey, if you've listened to the show before, you know I got to ask, what's your favorite kind of ice cream? Oh, man. I hate to be boring, but it's chocolate. There's nothing boring about good chocolate, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, legitimately, there's nothing wrong with good chocolate. Yeah, that's the truth. That is the truth, my friend, for sure. But yeah. I actually refrain from ice cream now because I'm watching my girlish figure. Oh, uh, well, you know, I, I'm going to get into that later. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try not to let my questions be too boring. But there, there are a couple that are going to, you know, they're going to get asked because it's cool. It, man. No, I, we're, if, we're roll. if my listeners go, you, you had an exotic dancer on here and you didn't ask this, like every <laughs> guy wants to know, uh, but we'll get there. So I'm an open book. I'm an open book. I don't care. You can ask me anything, my friend. Corey, tell us a little about your book and what inspired it. Yeah. So honestly, Brent, what it really inspired it was, well, first off, I I had so many people saying to me, you know, you've told us all these incredible stories and I was so entertained by them that, you know, you really should put this on paper because you've kind of had a bit of a crazy unorthodox lifestyle to say the least. But what kind of came out of it after the book was written, I, I took Quite a, quite a while to write it because it's about a hundred thousand words or so and I just had all these stories that were put together and then I, I it wasn't enough like I, I really wanted to make more of an impact with the book so when it came down to to putting together the rest of it as far as this the personal development side where I actually showed my my core values and the struggles that I had with those core values and then revealing that naked truth at the end of it those were all things that I added in after the actual book the official book was written and the thing was is that with that there was some some stories in there that were raunchy there was some stories in there that were really kind of like I bent my morality to a certain degree to be an entertainer at times I didn't break but bent it and I was raised by my grandparents and so my grandparents were depression era people my father was in the Canadian Navy he was a military guy that basically was programmed to not really show a lot of emotion in the first place which had a bit of a I guess um, you could kind of say um, uh a bit of a cycle that came with that territory where they dropped down through a lot of my other family members where they felt the emotional disconnection as well. So when I wrote it, and especially the personal development side, I added that touch to it. And so for my, my folks that raised me, but I didn't want them to read some of those things in the book and, and change or tarnish the image that they had of me as a kid, the, the kid that they raised. So my grandfather who raised me, he passed away roughly two years ago. And so that was when I really got serious about going ahead and putting pen to paper officially and, and getting this thing out there. Right. So when, and I know that he would never have, I guess you could say, looked down on me. I know that he had, he had a lot of pride for me and a lot of the things I did as far as bodybuilding and stuff, but it's just for my own personal side of things, I didn't want to reveal that. The only thing that I can say though, that I kind of regret to a certain degree was that he didn't get to read the parts where he realized that he, or that he didn't, he never realized that he saved his life or saved my life with 
those words a couple of times when I kind of hit rock bottom a couple of times in, in my dance career, going through addiction and stuff, right? And so a lot of the things that he instilled in me were just stuff like, you know, if you were, for example, if you're at a party, Corey, and somebody's doing the wrong things there, uh, the party gets busted and all of a sudden you go down with the rest of them. You don't even have to be the one doing the wrong thing. You could go down with them too. Those were things that went into my head when I was in that environment as well. And so I, when, I, when that kind of happened, although he was all the way across the continent and he didn't know what was happening with me at that time, if it wasn't for those words, I might not even be here right now. Like being completely real about it because I hit some pretty heavy rock bottoms in the, the, those that time uh, through that career, especially when I went to Florida because I kind of fell into a pretty crazy lifestyle there. And it, I went up to the top of the world with that. And a lot of those life of the party and had a lot of really good times, but that can only last so long. And, and when you're abusing things and you're going for you know hours and hours and hours or days on end of that, um, it starts to break you down. And, and really, um, I got into a pretty vicious cycle with all that right so it's definitely explained in the book deeper but that's kind of when it comes down to the actual purpose behind the book it just turned into something so much more than I ever expected to and it may allowed me to grow not only as an author but as a person to be able to actually now connect in relationships far better than I ever could before because I was able to address a lot of that as those inner things through the writing process and I highly recommend anybody even if you're not a writer out there to journal things just put it down on paper you can even burn it later on but at least do that for yourself because it'll actually connect some dots for you and open up some doors for yourself too so that's a lot of it really i actually uh, just recently had a journaling guy i've never been a journaling guy like i've never mm. i've heard people talk about the benefits of it and but i've never mm. i never got it right i tried it a couple times i actually just had a guy on the other day who at least explained it enough that i finally is like okay i get why some people do it now Mm -hmm. um where where it's just never something that's made sense to me at all but uh i i get it now why some people do it my wife is a journaler so. yeah it's it's a healing experience in a lot of ways because like for myself anyways it wasn't just about the journaling but it was actually also about recognizing my core values it was about like literally having the one word core value down where i could see it all the time and whether that was eight ten of them that i had wrote down and then i actually had the feeling that was connected to that core value where i could see it all the time and and recognize it and be aware of it because the thing is is that i couldn't connect the dots as far as my divorce went or for that matter if i was going through relationship struggles other relationship struggles I, I didn't really understand why I fell into those pits and so years and years and years later after going through that and then going through my training and doing this whole process I was able to not only connect the dots but I was actually able to really go back to even my ex-wife that I had been separated from for 15 years we'd only spoke maybe three times in 15 years after a pretty bitter divorce and it was really just about business and it wasn't a very nice conversation conversation, um, I was able to go back actually to her. And when I did that, I said, you know what, I understand now why this all happened. And it's not all about me. It's not all about you. I'm not pointing the finger at you anymore. I'm not playing the blame game anymore. I did that for long enough. I just want you to know that it was at least 50% my fault that we haven't even split in the first place. And it had a lot to do with my lack of creativity, moving into a different realm. You fell in love with the dancer that was, well, that was exciting, creative. He was charismatic, all that good stuff. And then all of a sudden I went into construction for a little while. It was not anything that was any, in any way creative and the feeling that I get from creativity is excitement so if I'm not being creative I have a lack of excitement well I'm not that same guy and so that really connected that dot and allowed me to tell her that that was why and guess what that did it released her from the prison cell in her mind of guilt because she was the one that cheated on me unfortunately but at the same time and I was believe it or not a monogamous <laughs> stripper for like eight years of my marriage but the thing is, is is that by saying that to her it not only released her from that prison cell but it released me from it as well I was able to truly forgive that person and and mean it authentically and that 
made me a role model for her actually to start living a more authentic life as well. So she grew from me growing and we were across the continent from one another when this happened. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that if a person's willing to, they're truly willing to go there and connect those dots and address their authenticity, then you'd be amazed, truly amazed at what can be healed from your past as far as maybe things that are hang, you're hanging on to that we, we tend to call it luggage. You can drop that luggage pretty quick if you actually work on your inner self, right? So, you know, I always promote it. And that's why I'm an authenticity coach now. And we're in, I always say this, Brent, when it comes to authenticity, uh, I, the word snowflake has been thrown around a lot as a negative connotation, especially as far as when you're looking at political stuff and all that. But I think we're all snowflakes. And what I mean by that is we're all individual. There's not one of us is the same. We all have a different set of core values. And more importantly, we have a different set of feelings that are actually associated with those core values. So that's what makes my life interesting now is, is if you were writing a book right now, or if you were taking my course right now, I'd be diving deep with you and saying, okay, like, let's do it. You know, we got to list off yours. We got to get into the feelings connected to yours. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm just going to gently guide you in the right direction because I've walked through that fire already and just say hey this is the way you do it and you'll be amazed at the results that you get from that just by being one word aware it's really what it comes down to so yeah it's massive now before we started recording you and i were talking a bit about your crazy life because <laughs> the stories in the book are pretty epic dude I, i'm not gonna front the, the stories in the book get pretty epic uh <laughs> thank you I living appreciate vicariously that. through your life that's uh but we talked about uh, before we got going Club La Vela and Cashes. Uh, turns yeah. out you and I cro- went through some of the same areas, different ways, totally. but the same areas at different times. I was uh, when I was reading the book, I was like, "Man, I was only a couple of years behind that tour uh, yeah. when I was there." But people have these. You, you said at the beginning, people have these crazy images of what a stripper or do you prefer exotic dancer, whatever the proper term is, right? Mm-hmm. Of what yep. that looks like. And we were talking about that a little bit before uh, we started recording because mm-hmm. you know, I've had some experience with friends who are exotic dancers and really their life looks nothing like people would imagine it at this point. Sure. Um, yeah. So just bare bones it, what is it like to be in this industry? Well, first off, I think that people have every right to have their perspectives. I think that you know, when it comes down to understanding people for myself, anyways, one thing that I've definitely learned in this last little while is, is really to, to respect other people's perspectives and open your mind up to understanding what people see through their lens in life. Like you're raised in a different place. Maybe you have a different ideologies, whatever it might be. You, it, not everybody thinks like you. And so when it comes down to the people's perspe- perception of what a male exotic dancer is, well, to me, you know, I was just strictly an entertainer. It didn't matter what the person looked like, whatever. I wasn't selling myself as anything more than Dalton Strong, the guy that was out there on stage there to entertain. That was it. Like, it was all about making the money and all that. Like, I took it very seriously as a career. That's probably why I lasted so long. But, you know, there is the stereotypical stuff out there that really truly does happen, right? And I've seen some really, some things that even male dancers have said about women in the crowd that I wouldn't want to even repeat on here regardless of whether you're open to that stuff i just can't even say it myself it was so bad and some of the things that i saw and some of the things that i even did right like i mean it's it's it was pretty wide open it was a pretty politically incorrect industry to be in when i started off way back in 1987 um you know and it just kind of it didn't really nothing really changed as far as the political incorrectness with the industry for quite some time now it's a foregone industry now it's barely even really around anymore especially with the pandemic and whatnot right but I, I, I really truly enjoyed what I did because I was able to get out there and like I said, get that reaction from a crowd in my own way. And I just, I, I never really, I always looked at it when I was in relationships. If it was like, even if I was only dating a girl for a week, it was about her. I didn't cheat. I never strayed. I wasn't, I wasn't the guy into going on, you know, two on ones or any of that sort of stuff. I had the offers, I had the offers for porn. I had the offers for all that stuff, but I never went across that line because for me, it really just kind of broke down to, did I, could I sleep at night? Did I really want the chaos in my life? Did I really want the stress in my life? Was it really even friggin' well worth it anyways? It just wasn't for me. So that kind of kept me sane through quite a bit of insanity really. And so when, when, and then, you know, when you look at the other side of it, where, 
or, you know, what a, maybe what a person in the audience might perceive as a male dancer. They have their own stereotypes about that. Well, dancers have their own stereotypes about the women in the audience, and they're all not right to be completely straightforward, they're not. Because not every woman in the crowd is out there to just take the male dancer home. A lot of the women out there are just out there to have a good time with their lady friends for the night, right? So, you know, the way that I kind of look at it is, is that it, it was an industry that I was able to truly enjoy doing what I, what, I, what I did for 25 years. I was able to be a free bird. I wasn't the guy sitting in the cubicle. Um, I was able to keep myself in shape. I was able to travel around. I saw all of North America. I even went to Spain for a short amount of time, as you read. Uh, that was a little crazy. Crazy. But also, you know, like I was really out there living life. And there's so many people in this world that I see, and this comes from Trent Shelton, but I'm not going to steal his line, but it is true. People focus so much on their birthday that they don't focus on their death day. And I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about the day that you die while you're still walking around on this planet. And a lot of people do that. And I don't want to be that guy, regardless of whether I'm turning 52 in another week or not. I don't want to be that person. I really, really still have that deep desire for being a free bird. And that's my mission now, not only to just help other people out with what I have the ability to do, but to be able to have that free bird status, to do work, to be able to work where I want to in this world and truly enjoy and love what I do with a purpose. So that's the whole take it off mission for myself personally. But it's, it's just expanding so fast that, you, you know, God knows where it's going to be. I'm planning on doing a TED talk in the next little while. So you never know. That might be my <laughs> next thing, right? It's just crazy. So one of those questions I, I have to ask, like I said, I, there, there are some surface level questions and we're not going to spend a lot of time on those. Yeah. Uh, so Magic Mike, did you see it? Yeah. Is it anything accurate or is it all oh, Hollywood? Half of it. About halfway? Oh, halfway. Okay. There yeah, you it's, go, it's guys. It's, now you it, know. It's Hollywood. <laughs> it's right. hollywood man hollywood really screws is. up so many things I, I just had to ask yeah like there's certain components like there's like little things like uh for example one of the dancers names in, in magic mike was named dallas in fact i think that was matthew mcconaughey's character his name was dallas well i had a dallas in my group right my group it was out we were working out of out of florida well magic mike was in florida a lot of the things that you saw as far as like the choreography or the emceeing and all that stuff that was all pretty realistic but they only scratched the surface really man on the reality of the scene not i'm not talking about like on stage I'm talking about off stage. Like when you're when you're looking at like, for example, a good one here that you might understand because of being from where the, being in that zone is is GHB, gamma hydroxybutyrate. Mm -hmm. You know, a very very dangerous, scary freaking drug that a lot of people were getting dosed with that were taking down there when I was down there, and you know, people flatlined on that stuff. I saw my ex-wife almost die from that stuff, not intentionally. She got dosed with it, and so. You know, it's just one of those things that they only shed just a little sliver of light on that in Magic Mike where the the little brother actually passes out on the floor. And they did, But they didn't even show the reality of what that was like. Like, I saw people turn in purple and being brought back to life. And then five, six hours later, back there doing the exact same thing again. And it was just like, what? Like, hard to even comprehend, right? So that's, crazy. that's what I'm saying. Take it off is a little deeper than just Magic Mike. I think if you we were talking about my life story and you wanted to combine it into a couple of movies, go with Forrest Gump. Joe Dirt, Magic Mike, you probably <laughs> got me, man. Maybe a little Boogie Nights in there, too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, really, last surface level question. question sure. Every guy is, like, terrified of the idea of taking off their clothes in front of other people. Like, we all like to strut around and pretend we're super, super confident, right? <laughs> I mean, that, that's just, like, part of the male machismo BS. But we all like to strut around and pretend we're super confident. But, like, yeah, I, was, yeah. I was a diver in high school. Like not oh, just cool. swim yeah. team, I was on dive team, right? Okay. And so I had to stand on a diving board, and when they when they're diving in a pool, everything stops. There's no music, there's no noise. They they stop the racing. Everybody in that pool is staring at you. Yep. And they order our swimsuits a size too small on purpose to cut down the drag. And you're in this tiny little speedo standing on the end of the board with your butt towards the audience. And dude, like you know, 17 years old, I'm like. Just, just trying to hold my nerve together, right? And that was probably like one of my more confident ages. Yeah. And so, right, we all we all like to think we're super confident, but to yeah. stand up on stage and take off your clothes, right? Every guy has had most of his education based on porn at this point. <laughs> Do you have to be hung like a horse to have a chance in this industry? Well, <laughs> it's an interesting, that's an interesting <laughs> question because 
Um, first off for me, I had nightmares as a kid of exposure. Um, I really, <laughs> literally had nightmares of it. I thought to myself as a kid, oh my God, like, you know, in the middle of a dream, I've got, you know, my zippers open and it's hanging out and I'm walking down the street and everybody can see me. I literally had shuddering nightmares about that. Um, the crazy part was that just like any fear, a lot of the time, your greatness is literally hidden right behind that great fear. Now, for me, it's more of a fear now than than ever before. My biggest fear now is really more towards the public speaking arena, because I truly care about what I'm putting out there as far as a message. But back then, the fear of actually exposure was actually was was pretty real. Um, but after I went out there to do a couple of shows, and I actually did it. And it was just kind of like, I thought to myself, not really that big of a deal because for us up here in Canada, we went full Monty. So it's full nude stripping. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, there's a bit of a procedure that we had to go through as far as, and it's a lot of people don't understand what a lot of male dancers had to go through, but here we actually, and our agency had us actually, and this is crazy. And if you have kids in the room now, you might want to go ahead and yeah, their mute it for this guy's what we had to do was we had to go backstage and sometimes it might have been in a maybe you were maybe you were lucky enough to have it in your your hotel room or maybe you were maybe you had a a bathroom back in the where the bottles were in the back of the bar or maybe it was just a squared off curtain on the literally on the stage but we actually had to go get an erection and tie an elastic band around the base of our you know what to be able to basically give the illusion of being massive out on stage so yes you know <laughs> you had to have a certain component of the parts there, but even if you didn't have the parts, you still kind of looked bigger than the average guy just based off of doing what we called that tie off. So, and that was very painful, a very, very painful thing for us. For anybody out there that's, you know, can't relate tie a, tie a string around your finger until it turns purple for a little while and then pull the string off and you have that little <laughs> bit of an ouch when you pull it off times that by about a hundred and then now you've got what what i had to deal with on a nightly basis for almost oh, a decade you, you talked so, you told one story about having to leave it tied on for a competition yeah. because the guy was running late and they weren't didn't think he was going to make it so you got ready and then he showed up they so you had to stay off yeah. tied off longer than usual Dude, yeah. I, I was just in pain just re reading that part of it. Dude, that was an hour and ten minutes, and you know it was, oh. it was it was like the one of the best days and one of the worst days because I won Mister Nude Western Canada. It was nineteen ninety seven, you know, and yeah, you're right. There was a guy that came in and he showed up last minute, and I had already gone back and gotten ready. I was all ready to go. I had my costume on, standing at the door, ready to be announced to go on stage, and all of a sudden the DJ announces the, the, the other guy. <laughs> And I'm sitting there going, are you kidding me? So the guy goes and does like a whole print set and you know, ends it off with Purple Rain and everything. I don't think I can even listen to Purple Rain the same way anymore. And so like, you know, I'm, he's doing this. And, and meanwhile, 20 minutes goes by and I'm still standing there in pain. And, you know, I got sweat dripping down my forehead and stuff and I'm waiting to go out. And I had now I have to go out there and actually entertain and do a show. So you know, and, and, and high expectations, right? So the crowd's going nuts. I go out there, do the show, had a really good show. And then all of a sudden they're like, encore, encore. So I'm doing a couple more songs and it ended up being an hour and 10 minutes. And then I came back, Brent, and I got back into the washroom there and took the elastic off. And my eyes literally rolled into the back of my head. I was in such pain and everything went numb. And then for the next hour or so, I'm standing outside the door with a long lineup of women sitting there wanting me to sign promo posters for them. And, you know, a couple of them are saying, hey, baby, what do you want to do later on? You want to come home with me or whatever? And I'm just like, I'm useless right now. You don't want to bother because there's nothing there. Like, I want to go die right now. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. So, but I didn't have to deal with that when I went to Florida because, you know, Florida, when in the States in general, it's all about G string shows and male mm -hmm. dance reviews and stuff like that. So there was a different kind of stress when I went there, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just, every so, guy thinks that they're red, right? I've heard every locker room joke in my life, right? I was like, oh man, they need to pat me in porn. You have <laughs> no idea what those guys do to themselves to be able to pull off that one scene, dude. Well, I do injections uh, and all kinds of stuff going on is like yeah you, but you listen to your stupid friends say things like that and it's like you just don't know yeah yeah and it's so. again this is a dynamic that a lot most of the population out there they have no idea that's what a male dancer had to go through so for me when i again i put this out as an entertainment aspect of the story and stuff but at the same time i did want that to kind of be known because 
Yeah, like it wasn't all just cherries and whipping cream and have fun out there, right? <laughs> like there was a sacrifice that had to be made. And I'm lucky that all my parts work still after all that. Let's just put it that way, right? But yeah, it was just a... And you know, there's this crazy stuff that happened with that territory, man, because like, you know, I worked all across Canada. So could you imagine, like, just put this into your head for a couple seconds. I had to do sometimes five, six shows a night sometimes in Winnipeg. Okay, on a Thursday night in Winnipeg for a male dancer, you would get booked five or six times a night. So you're doing your first show at seven o'clock and you're ending it off at about two o'clock in the morning. Right. And for at least two or three of those shows, you had to tie off and you're actually getting driven from show to show. So I actually had a personal driver that took me around and you had to be pretty comfortable because I was literally getting off of a show, jumping into the car had my costume on i'm sitting back there trying to get an erection in the back seat wrapping an elastic band around this thing and going back out there to do another show and then pulling it off going and in, in, again having to do this all over again so yeah it, it took some really it was stressful right and if you don't if it doesn't happen well your your show doesn't really happen <laughs> so it's a lot of stress and yeah, it's, it was, it's, it's not all it's glitter not, and fun boys so no, if you're thinking about it just Take it all in. Yeah, so, I think the, the hardest one that I ever had as a tie-off ever, though, wasn't from doing five shows in a night. It was at a club in Vancouver, Canada that used to actually not, they didn't even have a, a change room. All they had was this curtain that was squared off right on the side of the stage, like literally right on the stage. <laughs> and I'm back there with a chair, and, you know, like just trying to get ready. And yeah, that's what I had to deal with. So I was in that show. Oh my God, it almost didn't happen. Like I was just so freaked out. Right. So yeah, talk about pressure, like just on another level, like just craziness. Well, <laughs> I know you, so you got into bodybuilding at a fairly young age starting out. Yeah. And, uh, you really took to that. How many yeah. hours a day were you training to keep up your physique to be a professional exotic dancer? Well, I think that I was, I, I really like when it came down to it, I was trying to go pro in bodybuilding when I was age 23. Right. So I was really dedicated to it. I spent like, I, I rubbed shoulders. Again, I think that when you're trying to, it's a good idea to really, a lot of the time, put yourself in the environment, surround yourself with the people that are doing it, that you want to mirror what they're doing. You don't necessarily want to be them, but you want to actually at least kind of go where they're going. So I was in this hardcore bodybuilding gym in, in Surrey, British Columbia called Gators Gym back in the day. A lot of a lot of pros went in and out of there. And I was, like I say, I was actually associated with a lot of these people that, that had done it. So um, going in, you know, I was a bit of a gym rat. I, yeah, even in my last year of high school, I think when I was 18 years old, I even... I think I even took a couple of spare classes in my last semester just to be able to go to the gym more and kind of <laughs> negated my education just to build my body up. So yeah, I, I, I dedicated a lot of time to it. And sometimes I'd spend a couple hours in the gym, but really it wasn't so much about the time that I spent in the gym more. It was about the, the, the things that I put into me as far as just like what 85% of it is your diet. So, you know, I was at one point, you know, just boiling chicken and doing all the stuff that you do to be able to drop weight to be able to compete and that's where you get the freak to be a freak mentality that's when you're actually doing things that the other guy that's going to be up there on stage is not willing to do so yeah i was the guy that was in there the gym was closing at 10 o'clock i was still on the bike at 5 to 10 with my training partner and he's turning around saying to me you know what you're going to do really good in this show and i was like why he said because you're still here and nobody else is like you're the one and let's keep going push push harder so i believe firmly that the the, the disciplines like an elastic band man you can pull it out and you can stretch that thing out and when you get it stretched right out a lot of the time it doesn't 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 come back it actually stays stretched out so now even though i'm not a bodybuilder anymore i implement that same discipline into my yoga practice when i go do hot yoga i'm 150 percent when i'm in there like the 20 year old that's next to me that's trying to do yoga i kind of feel for him because this old 50 year old guy's out there just killing <laughs> it next to him right i'm sweating my you know tail off and i'm not being egotistical saying that i just go I still really go hard. If I'm right. passionate about something, I go all in, right? So I did it for bodybuilding and it, that helped me to, you know, really sustain a pretty good career. And even when I went to Florida, like I was very dedicated, even when I was partying and stuff, I still stayed in the gym. I was really dedicated to it. And even when I was down there, like I had people guys where I was dancing was saying, Oh yeah, you must be doing steroids. And I did do steroids when I was in the bodybuilding, when I was trying to go pro, but I was long gone out of that when I was in Florida, like years went by. And I still wasn't at that time. I was just actually a natural bodybuilder. And 
I've had people accusing me of doing it. And I was like, thank you. I guess I'm doing <laughs> something right. Yeah. You apparently know? it so, works. Yeah, it worked. Right. So it's, you know, but if you really truly love something and you're, you're in it, you know, it's not like work. And, and I, I never felt like when I stepped in the gym, it was like work. I, I love the, the scene altogether. And in a way I kind of miss it a little bit. Just my body can't take the joint strain anymore. So now I just do something that's, and bodybuilding, let's face it, is a perfectionism game. Man. <laughs> it's just like, it's just like body, it's just like diet dancing. It's a perfectionism game of competition and stuff. And I'm kind of over that side of it. Like I, I'm more into progression now and, really just accepting where I'm at and trying to be a better version. But at the same time, reality hits. And, you know, like I say, I'm 51 years old right now going on 52. So I, I can't be a, a stripper anymore. And being a bodybuilder isn't exactly the top thing on my my list because I'm trying to actually pull some of the pain that I, that I had from the bodybuilding arena for so many years. I'm trying to pull that out of my body by actually doing a lot more, not only physical stretching, but a lot more mental stretching as well. Right. So taking that sanctuary. And I think that for anybody out there, if there's one thing that I can recommend, and even if you have the kids, even if you, you know, you have all the, 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 the time is being pressed, take that time. Even if you got to get up an hour early or whatever, take that time for you, right? Whether it's meditation, whether it's just going for a walk in nature, take the time for you detach for a little bit, right? It'll help you out a lot as far as keeping a more rational mindset. So I was, I was never into the bodybuilding because it's always so subjective to me. I'd watch bodybuilding competitions and be like, why did he win instead of him? Cause like, I'm, yeah. I, I'm not agreeing with judges. Like, man, that is so, so subjective, right? You have just incredible specimens up there. So I always prefer yeah. things like strongman or powerlifting where it's like, no, they, they picked up more weight than you did, period. Just that, that that's that's the win right there. I, I don't care. But, but here's the craziest side of that, man, is, is that even the day that I was on stage, even the day that I was like, just I had my, the crowd was chanting my name, even the day that like I, I hit the pinnacle of my, of my bodybuilding career and I never did continue on because I didn't want to be dead by the time I was 45. But like, what I'm saying is, is even when I had those pictures from that show, I would still sit there and look at myself and go, oh, yeah. should have worked harder on the calves, should have worked harder on this, just totally <laughs> critical. Right. And so we're all so hard on ourselves, right? And so like, I was always so hard on myself. I dropped something on the floor in the kitchen and it would just be like, oh, way to go, Corey. And you know, the crazy thing when you do that and you don't realize, but when you're actually doing that, even if you're by yourself, you actually carry that like Murphy's law for the rest of the day in a lot of ways. And then what happens is you start projecting that negativity off on other people, not even knowing a lot of the time. So, you know, I kind of felt like I owed it to the people in my environment to straighten that out about myself and not have so much negative self-talk, not be so picky and, you know, just just as aggressive towards my own self. I started trying to be a little bit more kind because it can really be easy to fall into that trap of negativity, especially on, you know, just that negative self-talk. I was notorious for it for so many years, right? So and there's yeah. certain things that are just, if you stay in them, right? Even if, if, even if you try and give yourself a little kindness, right? There are certain, there's a certain form of, in, in any strength based thing, there's, there's a certain, level of body dysmorphia mm. you you know you were criticizing yourself when you were at, at the apex of your performance right yep um i have but i mean honestly right even if we take it down a notch have you ever met a guy who said i'm strong enough no right no i i deadlifted 630 pounds right and That's good. my my dad asked me it's like so because my dad was never a workout guy, but he's like, but okay, so what now? Uh, is that good? Because he didn't understand. He's like, I don't know why would you want to do that anyway? Right. I was like, to just do it? He's like, so so is that it? I was like, no, now I start working on 650. He's right. like, when is it enough? I'm like, I don't That's know. But that's the problem with that com right? perfection exactly. comparison game, right? Like, that's why I'm saying I love so much the pra practice of yoga now because it's not perfection. You screw up a pose, who cares? You know, it's, it's just all I'm saying is, is that I feel that when I'm progressing in this now, I am not hard on myself anymore. I know that what I'm doing for myself is beneficial. And even if I screw up, it's okay. And failure, yes, 
you can learn from failure, but I used to seek failure in the gym and go to the point where you couldn't go anymore to be able to grow. Mm -hmm. Now I seek failure in a different way when it comes to putting myself, like a, for example, a stand up comic, a stand up comic will go out there and if they bomb, that's a good thing for them as suck as much of a crappy experience as it is to bomb. They still grow from that. They learn from that. The next time they come out, they're not going to say the same thing. They're going to hit that punchline better or whatever it takes. Right. They constantly go back to, to failure over and over again. Right. So I just kind of feel now that, that I, I can accept it a lot more and just go tomorrow's another day and, and move on and be okay with it. Whereas I wasn't okay with it before. So yeah, it's just a change in mindset a lot of the way. Oh, as, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. And there, there are just certain things like, honestly, I don't know if I could lift to maintain. Mm. I, I've spent so many years trying to, and, and I'm not a competitor or anything, right? It's mm. I, I compete with myself. Sure. Um, I'm about to close the door on getting my certified personal trainer through the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Nice. Uh, because it's something I've always wanted to do. Congrats. I've trained a lot That's of people awesome. on the side. Uh, for years, my wife and I was like, we should probably just get your certification so you can actually charge the people you train. <laughs> you know, right. Maybe make an income out of it instead of just doing it for free. Because my workout partner yeah. used to tease me about being the greatest free trainer in the gym. Because uh, I've <laughs> done years and years of work. I've recovered from breaking my back twice now. Ooh, but dang. <laughs> not not wow. fun. But, you know, uh, so I'm about to do that. But I don't know that I could ever, like stay in the gym and just lift to maintain. Yeah. Because I, yeah. I get got it. I get in there. I want to compete with me. I don't, I don't even want to compete with the other guy. I was like, yeah. I, I want another rep. I want a yeah. couple more pounds in there. Right. Um, yeah. There are just certain environments that bring that out. Sure. And you either have to go like, uh, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm just going to, I'm going to switch sports for a little while. I'm going to take up walking or I'm going to take up yoga. I'm going to do something a little different. That doesn't quite push as much sure. competition yeah. with myself even uh, because there's just there are some of us that if you stay in that, you can't get away with it, right? There are just some things where you've got to compete with yourself even. Yeah, and it's kind of a weird thing, the weird dynamic, because like I relied so much on my exterior and I was able to lean on that because I, I built myself that much, right? Mm -hmm. that, that I was able to get away with so many things and able to do this crazy career for so many years. And the funny thing, though, is, is that I, I had this inside of me that this, this these, these issues, these things that I didn't address because I was able to get away with it. So that's why my book has the mask on one side of my face and not on the other side is because it was literally hiding behind my alter ego for all those years. And I wasn't being the best version of myself. And that mask is actually my charm. And the charm is something that I do reveal in the book. And I'll give a little tidbit of that is, is that the charm represents something really important to me. And what it was is I was always kind of seeking acceptance when I was a kid, um, kind of looked at myself as mediocre. Maybe other people didn't, but I kind of did. And we all have those things, especially when you're a teenager where you're trying to get acceptance, you're trying to be the cool kid at the back of the bus, whatever it might be. I was always trying to be something that I wasn't. And so then when I got in this career and I had a different name and I was a different person on stage and all that stuff, I was always trying to be accepted as, as a really great entertainer. And I was able to be trained by one of the best in the industry. And I did hit pretty high up in the industry here in Canada, winning Mr. Nude Western Canada and whatnot. But when I went to Florida, that was when the game changed. And when I got accepted into working with a group that was so big in the industry at that time, they were the number one dance review in all of North America. And what happened with that was, there was, we were, I was one of 10 new guys that came down to Florida to replace this group that was just, they had this incredible fan base that, you know, it was just a hard act to follow, literally a hard act to follow. So we went through the summer of 96 and I just remembered like, we obviously, we had people that worked with us. It was a very professional group. So we not only had the, our agent there, but we actually had a photographer, we had costume designers, we had all these, you know, components of the group. And one of the costume designers and the assistant actually to the photographer, she was, a, she ended up becoming a really good friend of mine. I really, really enjoyed hanging out with her. And we just kind of gelled really well, great vibe. And so she actually um, had gotten, there was 10 um, dancers in the old review. And then she had gotten these necklaces made and they all had the same charm 
charm. They were all custom made and she had the 11th one. And when all those other guys left to go work in another group in another town and all us new guys came in, she actually said to the agent, she said, I'm going to take the charm and my charm and I'm going to give it to the one guy at the end of the summer in 96 that represents the old group as close to the old group as as possible she's going to pick the one that she gelled with the most and it was i think around two o'clock in the morning we were out on the dance floor at the club and we were just having a really good time and she stopped me dead in my tracks and just turned around and she said she held my hands and she was like i have something really important i need to tell you and i was like what's that and she told me the story which i didn't know and she said I, I've been waiting to figure out who it's going to be. And I decided that it's going to be you. And she handed me her necklace. And honestly, Brent, I just said that. And I have goosebumps on my arms to this day because it was a weird thing. But in that moment, it hit me so hard because it was like someone that I barely knew that was so well, well respected and that I respected so much gave me something that was so dear to her that I still have it on my neck to this day i'm wearing it right this second it's on the cover of my book and yes i might have hid behind that mask but you know that entertainer that was behind that mask at that time he's a pretty charismatic good entertainer and i am proud of what i did down there as much mayhem as it was i'm pretty pretty proud of my career when it comes down to it but you know now that i have it off you know it's almost like kiss removing their makeup you know (laughs) It's different, different, different genre altogether. It's different, different, different world now. But I still look back on that very fondly. And that story had to go in the book because it represents so much just as far as where I feel from the heart on that. And she was one of those flat tire five friends of mine. So I haven't seen her in a lot of years, but, you know, I hope she's doing well. That's all I can say. So, yeah, it's crazy, man. (laughs) I keep saying crazy, but it was a crazy industry. It definitely was from the stories you put in your book, man. (laughs) <laughs> Corey, you, you took it off professionally for 20 years plus, right? 25, yeah. 25 yeah. years. You took yeah. it off professionally on stage and yeah. you went to the next level and pinned this book and took it off one more yeah. time in a totally different way. And you took it off yeah. and let yourself breathe. You let yourself out and turn yeah. into a whole new chapter of your life. And you're trying to yeah. help men now take off their mask take off their roadblocks, so to say, their inhibitions, their problems they are holding them back from being mm-hmm. authentically them. Mm-hmm. How do we start? Well, three, three ten, things. Give me three things. How does it's our ten step start? Process. It's, a, it's a 10 step process when it comes to the actual training. Okay. But the, for the top three, number one, my first level of my course that I'm going to be releasing in a video format where it gives people a taste test to be able to, to just to understand what the training is all about. That's going to be for free on my website in the next few weeks as well. And so what, that only is actually going to be just for people to understand how this works. And the first level is called, is on authenticity and emotional intelligence and how important it is to synchronize those two things. If you actually, if you go too far into your emotions, you get irrational and we i basically train people to i guess instead of letting your emotions get to the point where they're a nine or a ten on a ten scale i try to help people out to nip it in the bud when it's a two or a three and so that emotional intelligence is just so important to be able to remain authentic because if it gets that nine or a ten quite frankly something very inauthentic is probably going to come out of your mouth and guess who is notorious in my life for doing that, my own father. And it was not intentional. He was a very good man all the way around. He had a heart of freaking gold. He'd give you the shirt off of his back. But he was so emotionally disconnected in in a way that he bottled up his emotions so much that it actually came out inauthentic and he had to go back and apologize a lot of the time. So I put it in my book. This was my tagline, nobody else's. But it was just basically the statement and it's in the very last chapter, let the damn break before you damn break. Don't allow your emotions to hold you in a state where you're going to end up blowing up. It's just not a good thing. So the number one, the first section of the course is on authenticity and emotional intelligence. But then the second one, which is just as important is on values and the feelings that are connected to those values and being aware of when you're the opposite feeling of your values. That's something that is a practice. I'm not perfect on that. I never will be. But when you're aware of it, 
and you actually recognize it, then you can actually control it. And we all have the ability to do it. It's just a matter of being aware. And third is, is actually what my, my trainer, Diana Ryers from Daring to Share Global, she actually created this and it's actually called the inner purpose feeling. And all that is, is when you actually list off your core values and you have the feelings that are attached to that, you take eight or nine of them or however many feelings that you have and you take all those words and you make it into one word. So my inner purpose feeling for an example is harmony. When I'm actually completely aligned with all my core values and I'm feeling amazing, the, my inner purpose feeling is harmonious. I, but I'm never going to be there because that's perfection. It's not That does not happen, but it's just being aware enough to be able to actually recognize when you're not in harmony. And when you're not in harmony or you're not connected, say, for me, like relationships as an example is one of my core values. If I'm feeling disconnected, there's a pretty good chance that one of my relationships is not working right now and I need to go ahead and address that. So it might be, I don't know, my girlfriend, maybe it's my dog, whatever it is, something is irritating me. And so I have to go back and connect that dot. That's my way of being able to train people to live more authentically is simply that. So it really, just because it's simple though, doesn't mean it's easy. That's what I have to say. It's a practice. It's not perfection, right? But I'm telling you, man, my life is a whole lot different now in comparison to the way it was before living on that slot machine. And I swear, like, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be putting together this course. I wouldn't be doing the one-on-one -on -one facilitation for people. I wouldn't be putting the rest of my life into this unless it really impacted me the way that it did and made my life that much better, right? So, you know, people say, be the best version of yourself. That's the way that I can find to be the best version of myself. Simple as that. Corey, this is the fallible man. We don't do anything perfect. You're okay. Don't worry about nope. it. Nope. Work in progress no is great. Thing. Because yeah, that's man. all we are here. Now, Corey, you have, and that website that he's talking about, guys, is CoreyLaneHilton.com. And there will be in the show notes, of course, uh, in the description, all the good places that I put everything. You guys know I will hook you up with all of Corey's contact information. Corey, is Corey Lane Hilton the best place to find you? Do you use social media? Yeah, yeah. I can actually drop you my um, social media handles that you can put into the notes as well if I haven't already. But uh, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, okay. all the gooders, you know, the regular routine. But um, best place, like you say, CoreyLeanHilton.com. If you if that's too much, go to TakeItOff.ca. It'll take you to the exact same place as well. Okay. Um, my book can be found on all the regulars, Amazon.com, Amazon.ca. Uh, if you want a signed copy, you can get it through my website. Now, the shipping costs are ridiculous to send to the U.S. So <laughs> if you want a signed copy, though, you can go that direction uh you can also get it online at barnes and noble in the u.s and online at chapters indigo in canada um yeah you know and i will also do this brent because i like it this much um i'll go ahead and actually put a code on for your audience as well just to be able to absorb a little bit of that shipping cost i'll throw a 10 percent discount on anything whether it be the courses whether it be the kindle version that's coming out in a couple weeks or the actual book itself and uh we'll just call it uh, f-a-l-l code fall code I'll do that all small caps and I'll put that on um, immediately here. And uh, at least that way it'll give a little bit of a break for the audience. And uh, yeah, even on the Kindle version, it's only going to be seven ninety nine for the Kindle version, but it'll give you an extra 79 cents off anyway. So there you go. <laughs> thank you so much, man. That's, that's huge. Thank you. Yeah. Corey, no worries at all. Man. Thank you for taking your life experience and trying to help people better their lives with it. That That's a good mm -hmm. step in life that most people don't think. They look at their lives and go, eh, it's my life. You, you have something to share. And now you're taking a school of hard knocks because you've, you've had ups and downs. And guys, I'm not going to spoil the book for you. Okay. Corey has been through the ringer a few times and then some with all the crazy <laughs> adventures along the way too. But yeah, you're taking cool. all that knowledge and experience and turning it and trying to help people make their lives better. And we absolutely respect that here. So thank you so much for that. Much love, Brent. And I'll say this to cap it off, you know, just didn't want my legacy in the end to be the guy that, you know, I didn't want to be on my tombstone, the guy that stripped for 25 years, right? Like, <laughs> I just wanted it to actually be something more that, you know, I could go out of this lifetime with my head held high, just like I left when I left the dance industry and knowing that I made a difference. And I just think that for myself, anyway, I look at it like you can only really control what's going on in your own world or in your own bubble. But if I can get this book out and I get these courses out to enough people to expand that bubble, then really what I'm doing is, is I'm helping out people to find the gray areas, to be able to understand people a little bit better, to not be so black and white and so tribal, right? Because we're all from different worlds. But at the same time, if we try to understand each other a little bit more, 
think it'll make the world a better place. And that's what I'm trying to do a little bit in my own way. So, yeah. Okay. That's never a bad goal. Guys, <laughs> this is Corey Hilton. The book is Take It Off. That should be easy enough to remember. Take mm -hmm. It Off. There's a subtitle, right? Revelations yep. of a Male Exotic Dancer. But yep. remember, Take It Off. I'm pretty sure you can find it that way. Yeah. And guys, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Corey, thank you for being here today. Be thank better you. tomorrow because of what you do today. We'll see you guys in the next show. This has been the Fallible Man Podcast. Your home for everything man, husband, and father. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a show. Head over to www.thefallibleman.com for more content and get your own Fallible Man gear.